I'm very excited we have Michael Hogan with us because when you hear a new book about JFK, you might think, hang on, there is no more new ground to cover. I can't go through another book about Camelot and the miracle of Camelot and the myth of JFK. But what if I told you this is a biography about the myth, about the legacy, about the branding? Because whether you're a big fan of the late President Kennedy or, or one of his detractors, uh, this is a book with plenty of fascinating material here for you. And it is a book for both fans uh, and anti-fans of the late president. When you think back on him, you have all these memories that spring to life. His son saluting his slain father at the funeral. Uh, these images of the all-American sports family, the large family gatherings of all the generations of Kennedys. As we kind of know, especially if you watch last year's excellent film with Natalie Portman, Jacqueline Kennedy began to reconstruct the memories America had of the president within days of his passing. That is chronicled in Michael Hogan's excellent uh, and really, really inspiring new book, The Afterlife of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a biography. What a pleasure to welcome Michael Hogan to Sirius XM Insight. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. Uh, thank I you. Think I, I should mean, probably stop talking and let you're doing such a good job yourself with my book. I think I'll just let you keep going. Uh, hey, man, I'll, uh, I hope <laughs> so because. To Billy Joel. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dad was a history teacher who who loved JFK but wasn't blind to the president's failings. And and, and you're a leading historian of the American presidency. Uh, when you set out to write this book, did you have that concern in mind that there have already been seven million books about the glory of Camelot, and were you distinctly trying to write? the kind of biography of Kennedy that no one's read before? Well, uh, it's funny you should mention that. I was very aware of that, because you have to find a publisher, and publishers want something new. They don't want the same old hat, especially when it comes to Kennedy, because there's already been roughly 40,000, not 7 million, but 40,000 Kennedy or Kennedy-related books. So finding a, a niche in there uh is sometimes hard to do but i was looking for something new and different so thank you for making that pitch it is a new uh perspective on kennedy i've seen not from his life or his times not from his policies or his administration but basically from his afterlife over 50 years i covered of how we remember john f kennedy and why so there you have it yeah i think this might be the first ever biography of a posthumous brand. Uh, and you think about how, you know, the, the loved ones and, and widows of, of famous people who have died from Elvis uh, and Priscilla to John Lennon and Yoko have tried to be keeper of the flame, if you will. Uh, and you really dug up an incredible number of archive details showing how some of the less flattering portions of the president's life were suppressed as much as possible. Uh, at the same time, how the family, Jackie in particular, really tried to um, leave America with the most positive view of this man and the values he espoused and uh, the policies he fought for during his brief presidency. That's right, and uh, it wasn't an accident that we remember him the way we do. It was uh, it was part of a program of memory put in place mainly by his wife, but carried on by his entire family and by his museum and library in Boston to to shape a memory, to remember him as he tried to portray himself on the White House stage. I actually talk about both Kennedys as kind of actors. They're playing the part of president and first lady, on a White House stage, which is a reconstructed White House, which is, you know, reconstructed by his wife for the performance of the drama of Kennedy's presidency. And he was, an, another thing worth noting, though, is that uh, he was an amazingly popular president. I mean, amazingly. By today's standards, we, we, we can't, we just can't compare. I, I think he averaged in Gallup opinion of approval rating of around 70% over his three years in office. Nobody reaches those numbers these days. A high of 86%, if you can believe that. And that came in the wake of the uh, of the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion. So he was very popular. Whatever he was doing, the image he was projecting as as president was in, resonated with the American people. And, and it's like, they loved it's like... it. They loved him. And then, of course, that image is sort of sanctified uh, by his martyrdom, as it was seen in 1963. And that gets him off to a very good start in terms of the memory he would uh, uh, people would have of him thereafter. 
making these strong and, and positive memories for, for we, uh, the people who, who lived on, I wasn't alive at the time, but to take us through our life without the missteps and the error and all the rumors, uh, we do know, you know, of course, about Bay of Pigs, but we talk a lot more about the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, the judgment there, even the creation of the Peace Corps. How did Jacqueline Kennedy, Michael Hogan, begin to reconstruct America's memories w- within hours of his passing? That's true. I mean, she frames his, uh, first she starts by framing his funeral, which is, uh, I started this book just wanting to write about the funeral, which I, I, unfortunately, not unlike you, I actually was alive at the time. I was, I didn't vote for Kennedy. I wasn't old enough, but I was certainly old enough to recall the assassination in vivid detail. And of course, the pageantry of that remarkable funeral, which I think is probably the most dramatic and poignant, uh, public event. Of the of the last 100 years, and she frames it uh, to create memories and linkages to Kennedy, to Franklin Roosevelt, to frame him as one of a few really great presidents. And she's very self-conscious of the fact that it wasn't so much what he got done; it wasn't his legislative achievements or foreign policy achievements. It was what he represented. And to her and to people who loved Kennedy, he represented the American ideal, what it meant to be an American, and how, what Americans value, the, and how, how they behaved, and what the American style of a man was, and so on. She had played a role in creating all of those images, what I call the Kennedy brand, while she was with him in the White House. They did it together, and after he was killed, of course, his funeral, which I started to work on, really tries hard to use the drama of the funeral to reframe that image, to cast it in, make it a permanent casting in American memory. And she just kept on going. You're right. She had this fame. This is caught in the movie, by the way. In fact, you mentioned uh, the uh, the uh, Jackie Kennedy movie. I forget the title of it right now. Jackie. Uh, Jackie, uh, and you're right, it's absolutely first-rate movie. Her performance is first-rate. And if you see that movie, you see how, how clearly to this very day we continue to see the Kennedys as they wanted to be seen at the time and ever since. And, of course, everyone does this. All presidential families keep the legacies going. But do you think that what Jackie Kennedy did was for the good of the country, uh, not just the Kennedy brand. Was it what America needed at the time? The excellent film with Natalie Portman, of course, makes it seem like Jackie planned out the entire funeral and the funeral procession uh, with much greater ideals in mind than just honoring her late husband, but rather giving the entire country something moving to rally around and come together. No, I think that's exactly right. She did both. She wanted to cast the, make the funeral a, a, a celebration of his memory but also to frame it in a way that brought calm uh, to the country. Uh, You know, when Kennedy was shot, that that event sparked what I call in the book a major cultural trauma in the United States and real challenges that the Americans had about their own identity, their ability to cohere as a nation. That's because they had the same problems then. That's the beginning of the problems that we have now, of north against south, of white against black, the beginning of the civil rights movement, the beginning of the anti-war movement, all the disruptions and dislocations we think of and associate with the period after Kennedy's death were beginning to appear then. Plus, there was a major struggle for political party. I mean, the Democratic Party, as it was known at the time, was breaking apart into north and south factions. The Republican Party was moving very far to the right, a uh, trajectory it would stay on through the rest of the century. And uh, so the uh, American political and social environment seemed quite unstable, and that instability was further racked, really, and aggravated by the assassination itself. And what, what she did in framing that funeral, this is often typical of funerals for great heads of state whose life seems to epitomize all that's good in the country. She used that funeral, uh, and particularly her innovations on the funeral, to help soothe uh, a a nation that was really racked and divided and aggravated by the assassination itself. Pull it together. In that sense, she helped Johnson achieve a certain degree of stability 
and continuity. Though it didn't last all that long, it, 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 it lasted long enough, I guess, to move the nation past the assassination and the funeral. And these are all things, by the way, that were picked up in the press at the time as well. What it meant to be in America, how Americans should now pull together instead of apart in the wake of the assassination and carry on with Kennedy's legacy. What were some of the other ways that uh, Jackie Kennedy and the family tried in the wake of the president's murder to transform his legacy into that of uh, his brand, be it the repetition of his, his characteristics, like his style, um, and eventually, you know, the product, the brand that was JFK, really became even more recognizable after he died? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, they, they began with the funeral, but then they, uh, and a lot of this they didn't have to do. A lot of it was just spontaneous, the eruption of Kennedy memorabilia, the printing of Kennedy silverware and glasses and everything else. He he became, right, the moment he was assassinated, he became a commercial brand, you might say, a product. And the so-called heritage industry, as I call it, movies, TV, mm. popular magazines, popular books, trinkets and toys and so on, just went into high, probably the, the beginning of what we now recognize as a heritage industry, which tries to make money, really, off the memory of the American past, our memory of them, and in the process creates new memories uh, or distort. They're more, certainly more concerned with the commercial product than they are with a historical product. They, they perpetuate the image of Kennedy because the image was so popular at the time. So some of this was uh, spontaneous or commercial, but a lot of it was the direct result of what Jacqueline Kennedy did in the first couple, three years after the assassination. For example, uh, there's probably nobody goes to Washington on a school bus these days without spending some time. I have two granddaughters that are going to Washington this spring, and they're all scheduled to stop at Arlington National Cemetery. And the first place they'll go is to the Kennedy gravesite. Which my Jackie, dad took me when I was six. My dad took me there yeah. at six, and that was my first understanding of who President Kennedy was. And, you know, uh, I've got a good chunk of a couple of chapters on the gravesite, and it became kind of the family plot of a nation. In the year after Kennedy was assassinated, 7 million people, 7 million people visited the gravesite. And the way Jackie constructed the gravesite, you know, for one thing, it's in Arlington National Cemetery, which right away is sacred ground. And only one other president was buried there, William Howard Taft. Kennedy was buried there because she wanted him buried there. Because it called to mind him, and as you stop there, here was a, a hero of the war, a hero of the Pacific War, uh, and a man who had given his life, uh, taken chances and given his life for the country, buried it in a cemetery uh, with uh, with other heroes of the yep. of American wars, including it, heroes who had been killed in, in the war. If I'm and not again, mistaken. Oh, and, if, of course, she located it right below the Lee Custis Mansion on a direct line to the Lincoln Memorial across the river. And she was very self-conscious about plotting her husband, her dead husband there, because she wanted to build an American memory that's linked between Kennedy and Lincoln. Both and automatically making sure... Sh- and making sure that PT-109 was forever burned into the national Well, memory. I was about to say, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the movie PT-09 was made before the assassination, right? Yes, so, barely. It was, he previewed it in the White yeah. House the screening room. So my point is is that the, the uh, mythologizing of Kennedy had started before he was assassinated, and, and the portrayal that we have um, of him and of that, that PT-109 episode, his war heroism, and um, it kind of, uh, uh, all of these people like the Kennedys helped perpetuate this myth, but it feels like the myth was already in motion, and and plus the shock of this really young guy getting uh, assassinated um, just contributed to that, and I don't, did the Kennedys really have to do that much to help move it along, or was it already... Uh, on the on the the journey before that. Well, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, the Kennedy and his wife uh, constructed certain images of themselves as they played the part of president and first lady on the White House stage. So what Jackie does is make sure that that performance is perpetuated after his death. And you're right, Kennedy actually uh, played a hand in getting PT-109 made into a movie. Uh, 
Mm. He tried to get Warren Beatty, as you may know, right. to play the part, but yeah. uh, Beatty dec- declined, and instead he, he got somebody else. Cliff Robertson. And, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so uh, she did that, and, of course, m- later on she not only does the grave site, puts it in line with, uh, with the Lincoln Memorial, which really makes it really the most privileged presidential grave in, in the United States in all of its history. And uh, she also, at the same time, of course, moves ahead with trying to get the Performing Arts Center named after. That's she, right. It become, and she, that, that's another symbol. I mean, these, these sites, like the Performing Arts Center or the Kennedy uh, Grave Site, can be read as text, and that's what I try to do in the book. I try to read them and what they mean, what they tell us about Kennedy or what she wanted us to know about Kennedy. But in every case, she is building, as you suggest, with uh, initiatives and images of the of the Kennedys as they played their part on the White House stage, as they constructed their image or their brand. I mean, he and was course, seen at the time. People remembered the famous White House parties and the state dinner. Right. She had uh, elaborate entertainments, you know, that involved the high arts and in some, some cases the low arts. She was known, and he was known as patrons of the art. She did her own television special on the, giving the American mm-hmm. people a tour of the White House. She had recently helped to reconstruct and as a stage for the performance. And, you know, she won an Emmy for that. So she was no slouch That's when it right. came to her own performance, you might say. That's so absolutely between right. the grave site, the Kennedy Museum, uh, the Kennedy uh, Performing Arts Center, and then, of course, there's a famous example I, take, I talk about in my book, which is the... Uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, mm-hmm. uh, renamed in honor of President Kennedy, but calling to mind there his great contributions to space travel, the space program, and the, the, the uh, putting, a, putting a man on the moon, which, of course, spoke to his sense of adventure and his constant, his official rhetoric, which celebrated American greatness and the fact that all problems could be solved. There was no challenge too small, even putting a man in the moon. All this was designed to recall that rhetoric and his style as president and perpetuate it. And of course, at the same time, other aspects of his life, the private dimension, his Addison's disease, um, the other ailments he had, the uh, they were co- covered up. Too, so many affairs in the White House, we can't even count yeah, them his, practically. His hobbies, uh, yes. Um, and and, another, it's, and, and thing, you know what's that, interesting? That's all hidden. Or buried. You, you know what's interesting too is that um, his uh, the, the myth of the mythologizing of Kennedy it really goes all the way forward to the movie JFK, which which portrays um, which portrays this giant conspiracy, but it also portrays J. You know it 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 very much mythologizes JFK like thirty years later of or twenty years later whenever the movie was made about he was a great person who wanted to change things in in the White House and uh, everyone was against him and that's why he was assassinated because he wanted to do good. It, it kind of just goes on and on and on forever. No, I, well, you know, I agree. Uh, not only that book, but you can think of several other books that uh, carry the same kind of thing. Even Stephen King's uh, uh, book on the subject. Oh, right. Absolutely. Kennedy doesn't deal with Kennedy per se, it, 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 but it deals with Oswald, but it definitely leaves the impression that once Kennedy was out of the picture, bad things began to happen. Right. And I'm and glad of course you mentioned... it's true, if you think about it, bad things <laughs> began to happen. You had LBJ in the war, you had yeah. in Watergate, you had runaway inflation, the Iran crisis, uh, all the rest of it. It, it, got, it got bad in a hurry. And I talk about that in the last chapter of my book, that one of the reasons for Kennedy's enduring memory is that it seems, looking back to so many people, as it was the last happy time in American life, you know, when we were confident as a nation, we believed in government, we had uh, progressive policies at home and uh, abroad, Uh, no problem was too small, young people were volunteering for service at home and around the world, VISTA and uh, the Peace Corps and so on. So looking back today, it's like remembering our best selves in the early 1960s and the nation's best self, you might say. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, I, and I it's, think before, they're, they're... it's before Billy Joel was around, too. So it really has that glow yeah. to it. 
in fairness, I think there are some uh, African Americans or women or gay people mm. or Latinos who might not think it was that idyllic a time. But of course, in the national consciousness, that's our memory. Clint Eastwood made a whole movie called The Perfect World about that and what we thought America was before we lost JFK. And I'm glad, Mr. Hogan, you mentioned the Kennedy Space Center because that helped cement in the public's mind that the moon landing was a victory for the slain president and the Kennedy, the Kennedy uh, Center for the Arts as well. And you detail in the book the number of libraries and exhibits and film projects which were dedicated to this effort. It's, it's, it's staggering, and it seems like Jackie Kennedy, for all of her lack of having a, a, a public persona and her privacy, it seems she stayed very busy in those private years helping craft this legacy, uh, not just to make her husband look like a good guy, but also to give the country something to believe in. Well, exactly. And she wanted to, to, to remember him as the ideal, the American ideal, the, what Americans could be at their best. And so he became synonymous with the nation at its best. So did other people. You know, when the, the British de- dedicate a, 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 a chunk of Runnymede, the most famous, one of the most famous historical sites in England uh, and a site of commemoration of the birth of constitutional government and democracy, they dedicate that to, they deed it to the United States and dedicate it to Kennedy's uh, memory. It still draws about a thousand people a year to go see that. They dedicate it to the son of one of their most least liked ambassadors to England. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) He doesn't get mentioned much in these celebrations in England, but he did because they loved him. He, he loved England, and he spent a lot of time there. But the point is that he, by doing that, they kind of made Kennedy the legitimate heir of British constitutional government, and they aligned yep. British constitutional government with American democracy and identify him with both. So his name becomes synonymous with democracy in England and with uh, and boy, the rea- European reaction to Kennedy's death, which I detail in the book, is fantastic. It's fun- phenomenal. I mean, it was he was mourned in, around the world almost as much as he was mourned in the United States, and often for the same reason. So it wasn't just an American phenomenon. It was quite global, international, really, in scope. One of your chapters in the book is called The Memory Wars Contesting Kennedy. How has the debate over the president evolved in the 50 years since his death? Well, in the first decade or so, I would say he was uh, the, the history was dominated by friends and, and uh, co-workers with Kennedy, people like Sorensen and uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. and so on. They wrote the great, magnificent books, uh, which really kind of told Kennedy's story as Jacqueline Kennedy wanted it told. Usually, in fact, they submitted their manuscripts for her review and, and approval. And uh, she exercised as tight a control as possible over the published literature on Kennedy for the first 10 years. After that, in the wake of, uh, of Vietnam War and then followed by Watergate, American political culture changed quite a bit. And uh, there emerged what's called the New Left School of Historiography, which took a very dim and highly critical view of Kennedy and uh, thought he was overdrawn. He showed, uh, to paraphrase, uh, sort of paraphrase uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, he needed uh, uh, more courage and less profile. So he was <laughs> nervous. He was, he was afraid of uh, the Republicans and the conservatives who dominated Congress. He didn't stand up to them. He was really actually not so much a peace neck, but very aggressive in the Cold War, pursued, even escalated the armed race, got us into Vietnam, and blah, blah, blah. Very critical view of Kennedy, and just more or less, more or less the uh, uh, opposite of what Schlesinger and Sorensen and others had said in the first generation of Kennedy scholarship. And that lasted through the 80s and a little bit into the 90s. There's still echoes of it today, but for the most part, all of that, the, what I would call the first generation of scholars and the revision of scholars who follow, all of that has fallen by the wayside now, given way to what some people call post-revisionist scholarship. People like Larry Sabato, who wrote a magnificent yep. big book on Kennedy, or, or of course, Robert Dalek, the other, the other great historian. These, these, these people don't hide or run away from Kennedy's weak points and uh, flaws. They're prepared to mention them, but they also give him credit, mainly by putting him in the context of his times. 
uh, you know, they they recognize he you know won by forty nine point five percent of the voters. I mean, he had a bare bare uh, plurality, and he didn't have a large legislative uh, mandate. In other words, he had to deal with a Congress that was dominated by conservatives. That is, Republicans and conservative Southern Democrats who were pretty much hostile to almost his entire agenda. So the post revisionists give him some credit for getting done what he did get done against enormous odds and obstacles that were put in his way. And uh, so they come up, the, the result is kind of a mixed bag, uh, sort of blends some of the negatives associated with, uh, with the left wing or new left writers of the uh, 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. with some of the very positive view articulated by Schlesinger and others in the first generation of Kennedy scholars. You know, I, I've... And that's, that's still the dominant view. In fact, it's become more dominant uh, and, in fact, more benign. I think it's become more benign recently because of the Obama experience, frankly. How so? Well, in the sense that Obama has confronted a very hostile Congress for the most part. Yeah. After his first couple of years, he just he just can't get any could not get anything done, basically. It was, no matter what it was or how simple it was or how popular it was, he just they weren't going to let him succeed. That's and I true. think what's happened is historians who follow contemporary events read that back into Kennedy's time. He faced exactly the same obstacles in many ways. And so they're willing to to give him put him in that kind of context and give him a little more cre- credit than the new left revisionists did for standing up to it and for getting as much done, and also for maturing in office. It's true he had the Bay of Pigs, but it's also true that he uh, he managed the Berlin crisis or the That's missile true. crisis without blowing up the world. It's and you true know what? that it's he was the, the very greatest... reluctant to abandon South Vietnam, but, no, but he was also reluctant to put ground troops, uh, put troops on the ground in South Vietnam. And, and actually, toward the end of his life, began talking about uh, pulling the troops out and de-escalating the contact, the the, the, uh, the combat, and pulling American troops out. So they've they've come up with a sort of a, a still a balanced view. They don't ignore the downside. But they come up with a uh, with a balanced view that gives Kennedy a little more credit than used to be the case. Absolutely, and, and you know you got to. I mean, to think about the fact that Americans view Kennedy both as an adulterer and womanizer and as a loving husband and father and family man, and those two images of him have coexisted for decades, shows how successful Ms. Kennedy's branding efforts were. I just have one question for you, not so much about the branding, but as an historian, I wanted to ask your opinion on um, the... the Continuing debate and controversy over the Secret Service and uh, and what happened on November 22nd, 1963, because former agent Abraham Bolden famously told Susan Cheever in Vanity Fair that he felt that the Secret Service back then, uh, he, the biggest problem, he said, was that they were constantly drinking. He said whenever they would go to any place, the first thing they would do would stock up with liquor, they would drink, and then they would go to work. This was, of course, very common in workplaces in the 50s and 60s. But this agent himself said that on November 22nd, he he firmly believed that the agent's reflexes were definitely affected by loss of sleep and the fact that some of may have had uh, consumed some amount of alcohol before the parade through Dealey Plaza. Do you have an opinion on that? I think I have. I didn't research that issue, of course, but I think I have read that they had been out the night before, including Clint Walker, the famous Secret Service agent who finally jumped on the back of the Kennedy's limousine and tried to protect Mrs. Kennedy, pulled her back from the edge, that he and others had, had been out uh, uh, carousing in the night night before, didn't get much sleep, or some of them were hungover, uh, and, and so on. So I think there was something to it at the time. And, of course, there's also talk about the fact that Kennedy also often caroused with Secret Service agents in sight, and so may have been following the leader, so to speak. I don't know about that. In fact, when it comes to Kennedy's personal life, it's kind of hard to know anything for sure. There's so many yeah. rumors, and you don't uh, not able to really prove every single one of them. But I, I have heard that the Secret Service uh, was, I mean, Clint Walker was honored by Mrs. Kennedy and also by the Secret Service and Johnson. He got received a big medal and all that. 
for what he did do, and there's no indication that he is, his reflexes were uh, slow he, once he realized what was happening. Uh, it, well, didn't I, it? I always thought it had more to do with the overall planning of the route of the trip that was the negligent part of it. Well, that's a whole other conspiracy yeah. zone because the parade route was changed that day, and I don't want to get into a Jim Mars conversation. Mm-hmm. I want to just stress one more time, if you thought there was no nothing new to learn about John Kennedy's life, I strongly encourage you to pick up Michael Hogan's excellent book, The Afterlife of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a biography, to understand better how the Kennedy survivors constructed this popular image and how the cultural trauma brought on by this assassination was tempered by America's transportation of Kennedy from history into memory. And regardless of, of what you thought of his presidency, there's a reason most Americans continue to see him as his wife wanted him remembered. A, a, a charming, stylish war hero, loving husband and dad, a peacemaker, a progressive leader, and above all, an inspiring figure. Michael Hogan has managed to write a book about how that image came to be cast in our national consciousness without ignoring the warts in all parts of Kennedy's life. What a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. My pleasure. It was great, you guys. Thank you so much.